So our next speaker is uh, Antoine Savard, who will be talking about damaging viscous, viscous plastic sea ice. Um, so Antoine, take it away when ready. All right, so hello everybody. Um, I hope it's going fine because it's a really nice uh, conference. It's my first in person with all of you and nice to meet everyone from the community. Um, so today I'll talk about, uh, well, including a damage parameter inside the viscous plastic model. And so let's go. Um, well, actually, um, the goal of this, it, it's all about LKFs, right, linear uh, kinematic features, which are well-defined lines of deformation, like we can see here, uh, really nice lines. Um, these lines, uh, well, they are important for the Arctic uh, system because they affect the sea ice mass balance. And also there's a lot of vertical heat and moisture fluxes happening here between the atmosphere and the ocean. And there's also salt fluxes, and there's, of course, other processes as well. Uh, and so an accurate, uh, simu accurate simulations of LKF is uh, important for sea ice modeling. Um, so in this talk, I'll be using a viscous plastic model. But of course, there are problems with viscous plastic models, um, as it has been pointed out in Kuhn and in 2007, uh, and this has led to a family of models uh, that meant some of these problems, for example, the EB, MEB models. Um, these models are finite element models, which are, well, it's, so it's different from the VP model because we're usually doing finite difference. And they also include a damage parameterization. Um, and so uh, the, the, the like the different parameters that affects ice strength are therefore uh, the ice thickness, as in the VP, uh, ice concentration, as well as in the VP. But this new thing is the fact that there's a memory of prior fracture in the EMEB that was not that is not present in the VP model, right? Um, and so, how do we compare these two models that are that seem so different? Because any model with compressive and shear strength. Uh, well, it can reproduce sea ice drift, thickness, concentration, and extent, as it has been shown by many, many studies over the years. And so this, well, there was a shift in the community um, to the analysis of LKF's uh, special temporal properties like uh, probability density functions, uh, special temporal scaling, multifractality. But then again, in this uh, 2022 paper, from uh, Bouchayal, the Cyrex paper one, uh, they showed that any model with a transition from low to large deformations, well, at least at high resolution, can reproduce uh, these spatial temporal properties. And so there was another shift in the community, right? As you know, uh, to the LKF's angle and density. Um, and this is actually Cyrex part two, which will happen later today. And uh, I don't want to burn the, <laughs> the punch or something, but. Uh, they, the thing is, they all overestimate the intersection angle. So, in conclusion, all, more, all models are good in the same place, but are bad in the same place as well. So, we're kind of this, in this place where it's hard to compare MEB to VP. And so, well, there was previous effort to compare MEB to VP directly, rather than from uh, deformation statistics. Uh, for example, uh, MEB has been coded in finite difference uh, by Mathieu uh, in the back. Um, but there are other differences as well. So there's this uh, subgraded scale par damage parameterization in the EMEB that is not in the VP model. And there's also the consideration of uh, elastic deformations in MEB. There are no elastic deformation in the, this, the, the VP model. So of course, it's a bit hard, but um, yeah. So I'll be uh, focusing on this uh, damage parameterization. So the goal would be to disentangle the effect of rheology, MEB from VP. Um, from the damage parameterization in their abilities to reproduce observed scaling laws of deformation. And so this is the, the math part, but don't worry, it's only one slide. Um, so we start with the momentum equation for CIs, which you all know, I guess. And there are some forces, Coriolis and surface, uh, sea surface height, uh, some forcing. So in our model, it's forced by winds and oceanic currents. 
um, well, geostrophy. And um, there is also no momentum advection in this model. And the term we're actually uh, caring about is this uh, viscous plastic term, the real edge term. Um, and since we're using an ellipse, uh, well, you can show that um, the stress state is given by this equation. And it depends, uh, and both the both viscosity zeta and the stress depends on this p parameter, which is the ice strength. Right? And um, well, the ice strength is the usual one, but I mean, it depends on the ice thickness H and the ice concentration A, but it also depends on this new thing, this damage parameter D. And um, this da damage parameter is actually given uh, by an, a simple uh, conservation equation of this form. So you can see there's um, a damage advection in this model. There's a source term and there's a, an annealing term. So this healing term here is um, proportional to the damage. So the more damage, the more healing there is. And uh, this here is actually uh, when you when you kill the the, the advection and the healing, uh, and you solve for d, you get uh, a solution that asymptotes to this uh, square root here, not square root, but n root. Uh, so I'll get into the more in, in more detail on the next slide. So um. This damage is actually an extension of a proposition that uh, Mathieu made in his thesis. Uh, it has the property of being highly tunable because you can choose you can choose this n here parameter as you want. You can choose the damage time scale. You can choose the healing time scale. So you can choose very like whatever you want. And also, uh, it's quite it's fairly simple as it's. It depends, uh, the, the action depends linearly on this uh, damage thing, which, and, uh, well, and this is already computed in the model, so, I mean, it, it's not costly to run. It's pretty inexpensive. All right, so what's the difference between this damage parameterization and the one in the MEB model? So in, in the MEB model, um, damage is, well, you, you compute the stress state, and if it's, over the um, your uh, your yield curve, then you just multiply this by some factor that brings you back to the to the to, to the curve, and this side term here will enter in your damage equation, right? And um, so in this in in this formulation, damage is com understood as being the stress overshoot. But in our model, when you're inside the ellipse, you're viscous. And so this zeta term here is equal to zeta max. So there's no damage because it's viscous. But the closer you are from the yield curve, uh, the, well, zeta tends to, uh, zeta, this zeta here, which is previously zeta max, goes down. And so damage builds. But this is something that happens like, quite fast. Right? Um, yeah, and so when you reach the yield curve, you become plastic, and that occurs when zeta is super small, and this damage is, th th therefore, this uh, d term here is almost one. But remember that this is the, in the uh, asymptotic solution of the previous equation. All right, so for the runs that we're doing, so uh, when it's labeled VP, it's the control run, like standard VP model. Uh, I will denote VPD being the VP model with a damage parameterization with parameter N and TH, uh, because TD will be one for all the simulation. Um, and we do a 10 year spin up with a random uh, year list, and all the experiments takes place in January of 2002. And so we do um, different experiments for N equals one, three, and five. Uh, because the damage buildup is quite strong, and so, like, we need to to account for that. Actually, so we we reduce it with the the root, and uh, we do the two extremes for the healing time scale, so two and and a month basically. And um, 
well, you, you'll be looking at different deformation products, so the divergence and maximum shear strain rate, as well as total deformation, but it's going to be clear which is which when we look at figures. Okay, so for some results here. Um, so this is our GPS. Well, all of these are snapshot for particular three time, uh, three days average in January 2002. Uh, this is the RGPS um, observation. Uh, this is the control. And here are the three uh, model with different um, parameters. So this one is n equal one, three and five. And as we can see, um, let's, let's look at five, for example, like the lines are very sharp and not at all diffuse. And like you can see some very uh, new lines that appears that were not present in the, the control run, for example, they're much more defined. And uh, the more, and it's the strong, the smaller n, uh, you, 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 you start losing these, uh, these lines, as you can see here, the, for example, this one here is very well defined. Well, here it's blurry already, and it's even worse in there. Um, and this is the same figure, the same figures as before, but with a kneeling time scale of two instead of uh, 30 days. And I'll just go back and forth quickly, so we can see, like, basically the difference is that the lines get blurry, which is to be expected, right, since the kneeling time scale uh, is uh, well, it, it's smaller, so it yields more, right? Um, yes. And for the now, we're gonna go look at the different uh, statistics, and we'll be actually computing everything in this mask. This mask here is uh, well. This is all the it's a temporal presence of all the RGPS data, and we take everything that's that is inside this 80% pr uh, presence in the data, right? So that we get the maximum coverage for the RGPS um, observations. Oh, that was fast. Okay. <laughs> so we'll be looking at the probability density function, as I said. Uh, um, uh, well, so we'll be looking at the decay exponent, the uh, sum of binwise log difference to RGPS a bit complicated, but it's, it really is not. Um, also the cumulative density functions, uh, specifically the kolmogorov smirnov distance, which, which was first introduced by Bouchard et Tremblay in 2017, and the spatial temporal scaling, uh, like uh, exponential alpha and beta, as well as multifractal parameters, uh, the, the, usual, uh, um, the, the usual one. All right. So, so what do we have here? Um, yeah, so this mass green here, this is the control run. And as you can see, uh, it's doing quite poorly compared to RGPS in black. And when you, all of these colors are all the, the, the damage, uh, the VP with damage. And well, I think you can all agree that they all get better results as they all get uh, a bigger number of large deformations. Like all of these are very high deformations. Um, one thing to notice is that when you're putting in n equals one, you get these uh, curved lines, which indicates that it's probably more viscous than uh, plastic deformations that are occurring. And so, that's in part why we uh, we use the uh, other exponents like three and five um and you can see uh, when you when you sum all the difference between the lines and our gps like that the smaller the, the smaller this number the better it fits the, the the observations and all of these are quite good uh, compared to the control run um yeah, so here it's all similar and here as well, but you really get these, uh, these high deformations here, which, uh, which is nice. Um, when you're looking at cumulative density functions, um, well, uh, well there, there's not a lot to say, except that uh, the colors are 
not the ones that are here. Sorry about this. But um, these two here are n equal five, and you can see that it's uh, well similar to the to the control run, and all of these are a bit uh, further from the truth. And uh, in convergence, they all are better than uh, the control run, specifically the n equal three with. Uh, th equal uh, two run, which is super close from the truth. It corresponds to this uh, light green line here. And in divergence, well, that, that's where you get your money, right? Um, everything is super, super good compared to uh, the control run, uh, especially at n equal one. Um, so for the spatial temporal scaling, I think you, uh, you know how it works, but I have this neat animation where, uh, so what you, you have is that you compute the, the, the mean of the different uh, derivatives of, this, of the velocity in, si in squares, sorry, of different sizes. And uh, with the, so you have a mean for each of these uh, derivatives. Let me continue it. So you have one mean for each of these derivatives per bin, and then you do the average of all of these, these means, right, again. And you do this for a, a wide range of, bin, of bins. And um, yeah, and so what you get is that uh, you, you get, uh, so you get one point per uh, spatial scale. And these points here represent the average uh, deformation. And so, as you can see um, in the, the, the observation, this slope is uh, quite high. Well, in this case, it's 0.15. And the control run is uh, 0.05, which is three times as small. But all the other ones, so with including a damage parameterization, they all are better than the control run especially when n equal, equals one. So you get 0 0.14, and the other ones are all at 0. Point, well, half uh, what you would expect from uh, the observation. And, when you, and you can do the same thing for the temporal scales. And in this case, it's a different story. So the, 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 the control run is actually the, be the, the best, um, has the best temporal scaling at 0 0.24, uh, compared to the uh, observations at 0 0.28, while all of the others uh, with damage are a bit lower at 0 0.17 or 18. So it's, it's a bit of a trade-off. But where uh, this really shines is when actually, uh, like the previous uh, slide, we, we were plotting uh, this rela these relations with q equal one, but you can actually use any q, right? The, any moment of the distribution, and so we were looking at uh, this here, for example, the, these two, uh, these lines here. Uh, but when you compute this for all, for a wide variety of moments, you actually get that uh, the purple curves, which are uh, with n equal five, are much better uh, than all of the others. So for example, in the space, uh, the spatial multifractality of the model, the, 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 the control run is really poor. It's not, there's not a lot of, uh, of multifractality in this model, but when you include the damage, you really get this nice uh, curve, these nice curves here, which are much closer to the curves uh, given by the observations. And it's similar for the temporal multifractality. So in this case, uh, if I go back on slide, you, you see that it was pointing towards the fact that, oh, the damage is not helping a lot. But actually, when you, when you compute, uh, uh, when you put this in, in this form, uh, you can see that uh, for n equal five, uh, the VP with damage is actually starting to get better for moments higher than two. Um, Yeah, so in conclusion, there is, no, there is morally no difference between uh, different time scales of healing. So 2 and 30, well, all, all the curves are pretty close to each other. 
Um, the shape of PD of uh, probability density functions are much more important than their decay exponent. I did not even talk about it. Um, the damage improves the shapes of the PDF. So remember, they were all they all had higher um, uh, deformation. The damage also improves spatial scaling, not temporal, but spatial scaling. Uh, and also it gives uh, better multifractal parameters. Uh, well, the, the shape of the curve, at least for uh, Q bigger than one, especially at n equal five. Um, and so the take home message would be that damage is a powerful low cost knob to tune deformation statistics uh, in VP models. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Antoine. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Audience. Okay, so this is a dumb question, but what is damage? <laughs> yes. Like, how uh, would you define <laughs> that observationally? And uh, so damage is a parameterization. So what it what it means is basically that, I mean, it's it, it really just represents the fact that the ice is breaking and therefore it's weaker there. So yeah, so intuitively you can just think of it as being like like you break something, it's damaged. <laughs> I mean, there's not much more than this to it. Yes, but then this, it, since it can heal and break again and heal and break again, so the, this level of damage can can change in, in ice at least. Because ice can then like fuse, weld again and like break again, and, like there can at the same place or, or not at different times, different things can happen. And, yeah. So that's why it's a bit, uh, it's not like breaking a, a, a glass or, or something where you cannot really put it back together, but. Um, yep, more questions? See, I like you, I'm my favorite person. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so actually my question is slightly left of field, but I guess in terms of damage, the crucial thing is if the ice thickness goes to zero, it's damaged, but you can also have damage when the ice thickness does not go to zero. Like for example, shear failure can occur if there's a crack in the ice. The ice has not got zero thickness, it is damaged. Yes. So have shear failure. But anyway, sorry, my question was actually slightly left of field. Um, I've seen a lot of talks about scaling. I think I'm going to see some more. Okay. Um, are there size factors involved? Are these power laws um, of fractality and, and, and deformation will at some point be limited by the size of the Arctic Ocean, right? Yes. Um, so do you, is that something you see both in the observations and in your models? Mm. Um, mm, not. It's so not really. I mean, I mean, both they are both panarctic. Uh, they are. I mean, the observations are, are of course panarctic, and the model that we use is also panarctic. So, um, we're not really looking. At, I mean, you would have to look at different, um, like sets of experiments. I would say to really see if there's a an impact on uh, on these parameters. I'm not sure if I understood properly. Often there's a tailing off the power law as your length scale deformation approaches the domain size. Um, so I was wondering if you had a tailing off the power law of the, uh, of the deformation with the length scale. So it looks like a power law with, with L, okay, when L approaches the Arctic scale, okay, something different yes. happens. Yes, okay, I see what you mean. Um, uh, yeah, so you, you should not go too high. <laughs> I mean, yeah, probably like, um, 
think in this I am going to like 640 kilometer at the maximum um, maximum scale I'm I'm looking at. So I will not go higher than this because I think you just see like some sort of drop or yeah. Okay, another question from Stephanie. Thanks. That was a nice talk, Antoine. Um, I was wondering, do you think that the damage parameter should depend on the resolution of the model? Like if you think the damage is like subgrid scale, maybe like leads which are not resolved or something. So you say, oh yeah, if the resolution is low, maybe like, there will be a lot of those leads or diff cracks or whatever, and it will be already weak. And if the resolution is very high, then you're almost like, modeling an actual block of eyes, then it should get very strong, like with the stars. Uh, yes, so uh, I think this is especially good for low resolution model, like 10 kilometers or something, uh, because it, 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 well, I think it, it's, it improves the statistics of the formations, and it's at almost no additional cost. So, and since like, it's kind of low resolution in the, in larger, like coupled, fully coupled models, then this could be implemented, and it's it's a nice uh, thing. I think it's a nice uh, parameterization to have to improve at the very low cost, like the model. And so, of course, if you're running a one kilometer VP model, I mean, this might not be uh, best suited for these types of model. But I mean, uh, one should uh, maybe look at that. It might be me actually. <laughs> Uh, okay, we've got time for one more. If there's any more in the room. Nope. Okay. Um, and let's thank Antoine again. setting up the next talk now.